Australia is basically a large island surrounded by ocean that we know little about under that ocean. Well, when Defence came to me, you know, about a glider, they wanted a deeper glider and a faster glider. So they asked us whether we could build one. And I said, yes. I guess it really started when Ron took the initiative to visit DST Group after he'd done his work with James Cameron on Deep Sea Challenger. He had talked to us about some of the technologies he had developed during that. And I guess in the back of our mind was left for the idea that some of these technologies, the structured syntactic foam, the lithium ion batteries must be useful in some way, particularly in, in unmanned vehicles. So this glider will enable us for the first time to gather information in real time on the oceans all around Australia. So the concept of a glider is not new. The question was how you make them and to go to depths, you needed pressure vessels but the syntactic foam lets you get away from that and makes it lighter and cheaper. This nice article that I've read that says that blue whales have perhaps evolved to have their tail flukes mysteriously shape. They are in the same shape as this wing glider because that's the most efficient way to propel them long distances for a long time across the ocean. And the statement was that the future of unmanned vehicles under sea is wings, not propellers. The only time you use energy is at the bottom of the glide, where you pump out the water to make it buoyant to rise up again. And that's almost the only time you use energy. Other than that, it's just gliding like a bird. Or more correctly, more like a whale. Endurance is all that really matters. In real estate, they say it's location, location. In unmanned systems, it's endurance, endurance. And that's why these are so great. They are very energy efficient. I think they're a little bit different than a, like an average SME. You know, we don't just make metal parts. We don't make composite parts. We look at a big picture. We look at alternative methods, new ideas. People argue that large stifles innovation. And so I think Ron's a good example of where a small company with a niche product uh, has developed something that we have seen can be of great potential future benefit for us. Because that's how the isofloat stuff came out. Lots of people make syntactic foam, but not like this. Ron is unique, without doubt. He has a, his ability to address and solve significant problems that would often require teams of a dozen people. Ron seems to be able to do with one or two people and do them effectively in non-standard means. I enjoy all aspects of my work. You know, I might be you know, doing the design yeah, you know, next minute I'm down on the floor doing a pressure test. Probably where I prefer to be than in the office. Yeah, you know, people tell me I've got a great mind, but you can't use your hands. I don't know how you can be uh, innovating. These collaboration and partnerships are important because DST Group doesn't have the answer to all of the problems and issues. Uh, without collaboration with SMEs, industries and universities, we won't be able to provide the solutions and concepts that we need for the future. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, very much. After, um, yeah, after the last speaker, I feel very inadequate, but I don't have a 3D printer. <laughs> but um, very soon, I, I do hope that changes. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm probably better known for Deep Sea Challenger. Um, I started work on this project uh, back in um, early 2000s. I uh, started working with James Cameron. Um, it's just a right click, is it? <laughs> Yeah, a lot of my, yeah, how, the, the question is, how did I actually get started with James Cameron? Um, I actually worked in uh, Adelaide for a good 20 years. I was a broadcaster. Uh, but one of my passions was cave diving. 
and I did a lot of the um, uh, cave diving explorations to the uh, caves of Anullabur. For me, it all started with, um, you know, how do you get all these tanks and equipment through these caves? So I started building and designing this uh, dive sled, and really, I think, um, coming up with these uh, ideas or, or things that we built was really through necessity. Um, you know, the, in a previous expedition to this one, um, we actually um, used a PVC pipe. We just lashed everything to a piece of pipe, and that really wasn't, um, wasn't good enough. So the following year, I came up with this idea of, of building me the dive sled. It was a very simple device. It had an air chamber either end, and we could control this, this massive amount of equipment uh, underwater while the divers were wearing, um, you know, triple tanks and, whoops, I did that again. Uh, how do I go back on that one? <laughs> Pressing the wrong button here. Sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah, no worries. Yeah, um, on one of these expeditions, uh, I met up with um, a friend of mine, a, a cave diving friend, who are both um, uh, you know, key diving instructors and you know, we were part of the Cave Divers Association. And we decided to build this, um, or do a film documentary of, of a cave. Um, it so happened that um, after... Um, yeah, after I finished at the ABC, um, Andrew wanted to make um, documentary films. And in doing so, um, yeah, I was asked again to come up with other ideas to um, uh, build devices for filming sharks. We wanted a mobile cage. You know, there's a lot of people out there in static cages, but um, we wanted to be able to track and film uh, great white sharks. So this is another one of these creations. Um, we had these two Aquazep uh, dive scooters. I made this aluminium frame and we stuck Andrew in it. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it was actually, it was, it was great. I actually had the pleasure of uh, swimming for, uh, with a great white for 30 minutes. It was absolutely fantastic. Uh, Andrew was eventually headhunted by James Cameron and we ended up on this ship. It's the Russian uh, academic Keldish. It was a, uh, their science platform, and it was home to two 6,000-metre diving submersibles. And these are the submersibles that uh, he used initially uh, for the film, when he filmed uh, Titanic. The story is that he actually wanted to film... Uh, the only reason he made the film Titanic was so that he could get a dive on Titanic. <laughs> uh, that's one of the near subs. There are two. Uh, on, one, um, on one sub, there's uh, Jim's big 3D HD camera. Uh, this was actually his trial camera for uh, the building... Uh, sorry, for the, the camera he was developing for Avatar. It was a 3D rig. It was the first time electronic cameras have really been used in uh, the film industry. Uh, we went on and made a number of 3D IMAX um, uh, documentaries using this uh, first camera. Uh, in the lower right image is a little ROV that um, Jim's brother, Mike Cameron, developed. Um, and this would actually feed out a, a little fiber optic tether um, and, you know, so Jim could be inside the near submersible and he could control this little fiber optic uh, ROV. Uh, this is one of um, the dives on um, uh, Titanic. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah. When Jim was filming, we had one shippers or one submersible would be the camera platform. The other one just was adorned with lights. We, at the time, we were using HMI uh, lights, and we'd have anything up to eight 
or nine of these uh, 1200 watt HMI lights. Uh, it's the only way you know, to really get the images. Um, I managed to do a dive on the wreck of the Bismarck, which is in 5,000 metres of water. And it was, again, one of these um, you know, magic moments of my life, you know, diving in a near submersible to 5,000 metres. Uh, we also uh, did trips out to the hydrothermal vents uh, in both the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. And you often see nice, big, wonderful things. In 2005, uh, I was asked to, uh, to put a broadcast system on one of these Russian Mir submersibles. And it was on that, this expedition that we, we actually did a live telecast um, from Titanic. Uh, Jim was in, in uh, Mir 1. Uh, it was perched over the, the giant staircase and he managed to take this little ROV down six decks down to the Turkish baths, which have never been filmed before. So this is actually a you know, record, recent record of, of those baths. Okay, we started to get interest in uh, going deep. Uh, so we looked at uh, you know, various uh, spots in the ocean, and of course the Mariana's Trench was uh, key to all that. Um, Jim wanted a submersible, um, you know, to basically, you know, a, a, basically a filming platform so we could go anywhere in the world's oceans. Uh, we looked at what had been done in the 60s, and that was the Trieste at 150 ton. Uh, Jim wanted to build a submersible um, that was able to, that had to be affordable, so it had to fit on a ship of opportunity. Uh, and that limited the, the size of the submersible to 12 tonne. Um, by contrast with a Russian Mir submersible, um, that's the space allowed in a, that you have with the, uh, three people in, inside a, a sub. There's a skeleton uh, frame, and it's very typical of a lot of the deep diving submersibles. On the other hand, Jim wanted something fast that would get to the the dive site quickly, so it had to be vertical in, in shape, um, more like a rocket. Um, and this thing descended very, very quickly. I won't go too much into the detail, but we had, um, you know, it's a self-contained uh, submersible. The space, the life support space is quite small. If you can imagine your knees tucked up to your chest, the capsule was only so big. You had to contain all the life support system everything else had to be outside in the, um, uh, uh, in the water and subject to the great pressure. Uh, when we started thinking about this, um, the first thing that Jim said to us is that we need the pressure hull. Um, he was dead set on titanium. Um, <clears throat> at the time, this is mid-2000s, um, you know, um, the price of titanium had skyrocketed because of the demand on uh, titanium for um, various wars, and <laughs> the, particularly the war in Iraq. Um, and the demand was, was so, um, you know, the lead time for it was um, quite long. Um, I was actually told it was two and a half, two and a half years by the time we uh, placed an order. And by the way, you need to check for two and a half million to get the titanium. Um, Jim wouldn't have bought that. Uh, so I came up with a solution that um, we buy the steel out of Newcastle. We forge it in Albury in New South Wales. We machined it in Melbourne. We actually uh, head pressed the two halves in Melbourne. It came to Adelaide where it was welded together. Went back to Albury for heat treating. Um, Melbourne for painting, and then it went over to Pens Pennsylvania State University for pressure test. Uh, it's one of only two facilities worldwide that can pressure test a sphere to the, the depths that uh, is required. So that was quite an interesting novel approach, and Jim bought it, uh, kept the project in Australia. The other issue we had was uh, how do we float a very negatively buoyant sphere. Um, commercially available syntactic foams, which are uh, um, 
basically comprised of hollow glass microspheres of, you know, these are 20 micron diameter, uh, embedded in an epoxy resin. But the trouble is that they're mixed in vacuum and cured, and they're not homogenous. The heavy resin will sink, the lighter uh, bubbles would float, and therefore when you're subject to hydrostatic pressure, it would bend and distort and crack. And we didn't want to lose a large piece of flotation from the sub, otherwise Jim would be still down there. Um, so we came up with this uh, product ourselves. Uh, I went to Kitchen Warehouse and bought a KitchenAid top-of-the-line uh, food mixer. The lady thought I was buying a Christmas present for my wife, but it wasn't. <laughs> um, anyway, we ended up building these huge blocks of foam, bonding them together, and made this uh, incredible structure. Uh, the foam formed the chassis and flotation of this submersible, and that is something that Jim was pretty insistent that he have. Um, the sub is something like uh, 20 feet, six meters in height. It actually laid horizontally on deck. When you hop into the submersible to do your deck checks, you're on your back and you're looking up at your controls. And it must be similar to uh, you know, space travel, I, I guess, to some extent. Yeah, Jim described his dive uh, to the Mariner's Trench or the, the ride in the vehicle is something like an express elevator to the middle of the earth. <laughs> it, it just, it, it actually uh, started its descent at six knots. And uh, yeah, anyway, several hours later, he's a, um, yeah, quite a pleasant film producer <laughs> uh, having completed the, his dive. Yeah, um, after Deep Sea Challenger, I was a bit of a loss as to what to do. Um, you already saw a snippet of <laughs> what's coming, I guess. But um, Australia was surrounded by some of the deepest water on our planet. Um, off uh, the coast of Sydney, we've got 5,000 uh, metres of water, just 50, 60 uh, nautical miles seaward. Um, off the northwest shelf, there's 7,500 metres. New Guinea, there's 8,500. North of New Zealand, 10,000 metres. Even in the, uh, the Gulf, we've got uh, waters to 5,000 metres. So we thought that um, it would be an ideal opportunity to have a deep sea submergence facility uh, here in Australia. Uh, so we formed uh, Ron Allen Deep Sea uh, Services. Uh, it took a little while to get a, a defence contract. Um, we first of all uh, supplied some foam um, you know, to defence. Uh, they're very interested in our product. Um, you know, we built uh, various parts uh, for autonomous vehicles and finally we, we had this contract to, to build a, um, um, a subsea autonomous glider. And I think that's pretty much us, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, thank you very much for, <laughs> for listening. And uh, yeah, hopefully one day we might be able to print these gliders. <laughs> Thanks so much, Ron. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, here we go. Um, I think Ron understated the technology and the power <laughs> and the intellectual input into this project. Three men have been to the bottom of the ocean. Two of them are still alive. Yeah. John Walsh and, and Jim Cameron. There's been more men put in the moon than done this job. And the invention of Ron and his team. I just can't compliment it yeah. enough. It was very much understated. It was a huge, huge uh, project executed very, very well. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's all right, I'll do without the uh, microphone. <laughs> Hello. Um, first of all, I'd like to reiterate the other questioner. Uh, many congratulations for a rather amazing project uh, and ongoing great work. My question relates to the Deep Sea Challenger submersible and its future. There was some discussions about 
uh, further um, exploration, but I understood it was involved in a bit of an accident, and I was wondering if you could highlight uh, what the status of it is and whether there's future explorations yeah. in mind. Okay, the... Um, well, after Jim's dive, uh, the submersible was donated to Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Um, it was intended that it will dive again. Um, in the meantime, um, for those who don't know Jim Cameron, he works in time slots. Um, you know, and when he focused on, on the Deep Sea Challenger project, it was full on Deep Sea Challenger. Um, but now he's been working on, on Avatar. Um, so Deep Sea Challenger sort of went into, he didn't want it to go into mothballs, he wanted it uh, to be um, you know, shown to um, you know, the, 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 the technologies and the construction that uh, went into it, you know, to, um, to Woods Hole uh, Oceanographic Institute. Um, and uh, after they did a, you know, strip down and, um, you know, review of its construction, it was going to be um, displayed at Australian National Maritime Museum. And it was actually on transport to Australia um, when it was caught in a, um, um, a trucking incident. The brakes failed on the truck. They overheated. When the driver pulled up because there's smoke billowing out from the wheel, uh, apparently the uh, fire um, what did affect the, uh, you know, one part of the submersible. Um, so currently the submersible is, um, I don't believe it will end up in Australia now, but um, um, it, it, there are moves afoot that it will be repaired uh, when it dives again, I've got no idea. Last question, just run up the back. <laughs> Hi, camera. Howdy. Um, just uh, you touched on it a little bit before with the defence side of things, and um, and it's maybe not in Australia any longer with the repairs. But has it had any hand in the uh, research recovery efforts of MH370 that you're aware of? Because if not, I reckon it'd be ideal. <laughs> yeah, it's if somebody knew where MH370 was, um, it's you know. It would be a vehicle that could do, go down and you know, film and look at the, the resting place. Uh, but as far as finding it, um, it's a bit big. It's fairly slow in horizontal distance. It would take a long time to explore the ocean uh, or, or that vast area. And that is best done with either autonomous vehicles or uh, towed arrays and... Yeah, I, I think they've all re everyone's realised now. A new search, I, I believe, has, has started, um, but they've pinpointed the area down even more, and hopefully they will have a, a reasonable chance of locating it. But first of all, yeah, it's bathymetry, tow to raise, um, autonomous vehicles. Uh, then we can get the submersibles or ROVs into it. There it is. <laughs> 